It's one night later, and what we have here tonight is the finished free network attached storage computer, all up and running. Right there it is, ready to be set up. Um, as you can see, it does have a locally attached console with which you can perform some basic configuration, but in this case I wouldn't even have to do that because it's picked up an IP address from my DHCP server. Anyway, this is not my first adventure in a network storage. I've actually had this Linksys network storage link for a while, but it's kind of limited in what it can do, and this is capable of a great deal more as far as network attached storage goes. This thing can serve to all kinds of different file handling protocols, and it also has the ability to be plugged into a UPS, which I got a battery for last night, and I've got to hang it up on the wall right underneath that one. But it can be plugged into a UPS, and it can be set up such that when the UPS reports a low battery, it can safely shut down. Whereas something like that link says storage link up there really can't hope to do that because its firmware is too simplistic, and I haven't felt ambitious enough to try loading any third-party firmware on it. Anyway, there are two things that I'm going to end up doing with this machine. The first of which is I'm going to use the R-Sync program to back up files from a couple of different machines on a couple of different operating systems. The other thing that I'm going to do with it, and the main reason for building it, is I'm going to use it as an Apple Time Capsule work-alike. I haven't been impressed, as I already mentioned, I haven't been impressed with the Apple Time Capsule product itself and this does so much better. I have already tested that and been very comfortable with how this ended up working so that's one that's the other thing I'm going to set this machine up to do and then as my needs change down the road I may set it up to do other things and at some point more likely than not I will augment this machine with a couple of other systems set up the same way only they'll be built around something like an Intel low power motherboard using the Intel Atom processor there is one other thing that I did differently um, that I didn't talk about last night. I was going to use a compact flash card to boot this system up so that I could save the two internal hard drive bays for use with, say, a second serial ATA hard drive or something like that. It turns out the compact flash experiment did not go well. A lot of the problem that uh, was present had to do with the fact that compact flash cards can operate in a multitude of modes and evidently there's no easy way to change one to run in the ATA hard disk mode. They emulate a PC card ATA device and it's just different enough that it sends this thing for the hills. I found out with a lot of careful diddling, and careful diddling is definitely the word, that by momentarily grounding pin number nine on the compact flash adapter I could force the card into the ATA hard disk mode and after that things got a lot further but it was still a bit uppity and even if it had worked I didn't want to come down here after every power outage and have to ground that pin. And not to mention it's also asking for disaster. I mean if I'd have slipped and connected a ground to a power pin I either would have gotten to find out how good the power supply crowbar circuitry is in this thing or how big of a flash the power supply and various other motherboard components might make when they've had their voltage plane suddenly shorted to ground. Anyway, that leaves configuring this thing, which is largely done over a web-based interface. Now I'm not going to go into a terrifying level of detail about how to configure this for the first time because they do have some pretty good configuration instructions at the free NAS website. Um, but suffice it to say, what you need to do to get started is you need to sign into the thing, you should mount your disks, format them, prepare them for use, um, you should set the clock and the time zone, and you should probably change the default password if there's any chance that your network is not entirely trustworthy and you don't want people getting in there and playing around with your new server. Anyway, those are pretty much the basic tasks that you need to do to get started, and after you've completed all of those, you need to go in and set up your services, whatever kind of file sharing or file serving services you'd like the machine to provide, you can set those up. And then you'll be pretty much ready to roll. But again, I definitely encourage you to go and read the documentation that comes with this program so that you'll know how to use it better than I could possibly explain in a short little video like this. Once you've done your setup, of course, and one of the things that I'm getting ready to do here right now 
I forgot to mention this, but it's a very good idea. One of the things that you should definitely do is set your server so that it operates on a fixed IP address, so it's not constantly scooting around your network and making itself hard to find. But when you have set everything up, you can do all your management tasks from the built-in web server. For example, you can reboot or shut down the system like I'm getting ready to do here. By clicking yes, the system will actually go ahead and reboot itself. Takes a little bit. It shuts everything down safely. And then it reboots itself. Just like that. Now when you have everything set up on your server machine and your Apple file service is running and you've told it to advertise its presence, it should be doing so. And there it is right there. And you can use it just like you would an Apple time capsule. And there you have it. After a while the backup will start running. And even though we're going over wireless right now, which really isn't the recommended way to do this, you can see that it's moving right along. It would be even faster if I had a wired connection going, or if I had a gigabit infrastructure here, which I don't presently have, and I'm not sure that I'm going to install for a while. Now for those of you who are wondering, even if this old computer should fail, that's not the end of the world. The data is not lost, as the disks are formatted in the standard Unix file system, or UFS format. Now this isn't exactly the easiest thing to set up, but it's not hard either. All you really need is a basic understanding of Unix permissions and services and usernames and passwords and things like that, and I'm sure you can get through it. Now Time Capsule has definitely got going for it the ease of use aspect. I mean, as far as a Time Capsule goes, you plug it in, you run the Apple setup software, and you're supposed to be off and running. But that's really only true if Time Capsule actually works, and it's been my experience that it's not really as reliable as it ought to be. And as of late in the news, all these sudden failures of people's Time Capsules are really leaving them wondering how safe their data really is. So by taking a little time and building something like this, not only will you learn something, but you'll also get a much better performing, more reliable piece of hardware at a better price than Apple is charging for any of the Time Capsules.